You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you in further. You step forward little by little not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls and calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. Podcast. I am Nick Peters, your host, seeking to bring you the very best in Christian scholarship and apologetics. And today we've got an interesting show, and I suspect it is going to be a funny show because the guest I have on here, he grew up in Las Vegas. He saw the comedians. He knows how to make an audience laugh. So if you hear some laughter here, it, it's to be expected. And if you laugh yourself, well, that just makes it all the better here. My guest. Well, actually, he spoke to me at uh, Bill Craig's church when I was there after the ETS meeting. There was a little project conference there, and he asked me how my show was going, which I was rather surprised. And I said, I'd be glad to have you come on if you have a book coming out. He said, sure. I'll get the information, and I'll send it to you, and where have you? And I'll come on. And that guest is Francis Beckwith, someone I've wanted to have on the show for a while. He is the 2016-2017 Visiting Professor of Conservative Thought and Policy at the University of Colorado Boulder and Professor of Philosophy and Church State Studies at Baylor. And he serves there as Associate Director of the Graduate Program in Philosophy and Co-Director of the Program on Philosophical Studies of Religion in Baylor's Institute for Studies of Religion. With his appointment in Baylor's Department of Philosophy, he also teaches courses in medical humanities, political science, religion, and church state studies. From July 2003 to January 2007, he serves as Associate Director of Baylor's J.M. Dawson Institute of Church State Studies. And he was born in 1960 in New York City, grew up in Nevada, like I said, and the eldest of four children, graduated in 74 from St. Viator's Elementary School, and in 1978 from Bishop Gorman High School, and he was a free spot letterman and a member of the Nevada State AAA Basketball Championship team. In 2008-2009, he served on the faculty of the University of North Notre Dame as the Mary Ann Remick Senior Visiting Fellow in Notre Dame Center of Ethics and Culture, 2002-3, Research Fellow at the University Radio College and the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He's a graduate of Fordham University with a Ph.D. and M.A. in Philosophy, and he also holds a Master of Judicial Studies degree from Washington University School of Law in St. Louis, where he won a Cowley Award for Academic Excellence in Reproductive Control Seminar. And he's got <coughs> several, several books here, Taking Rights Seriously, which we're talking about today, Catholic Invitation to Latter-day Saints, Second Look at First Things, A Case for Conservative Politics, Politics for Christians, Statecraft of Silkcraft, Return to Rome, Confessions of an Evangelical Catholic, Defending Life, which I have also read, and that's an excellent, excellent book, A More on Legal Case Against Abortion Choice, To Everyone an Answer, A Case for a Christian Worldview, Law, Darwinism, and Public Education, The Establishment Clause, and the Challenge of Intelligent Design, The New Mormon Challenge, Responding to the Latest Defenses of a Fast-Growing Movement, Do the Right Thing, Readings in Applied Ethics and Social Philosophy, Relativism, Feet Firmly Planned in Midair, that one he co-wrote with Greg Coker, I've also read that one, and Greg Coker has been on this show before talking about his book Tactics, The Abortion Controversy, 25 Years After Roe v. Wade, A Reader, Affirmative Action, Social Justice or Reverse Discrimination, Politically Correct Death, Answering the Arguments for Abortion Rights, and the win- and it was also winner of a 1994 Cornerstone Magazine Ethics Book of the Year. And, you know, if I went on to list all these other works, we'd probably spend the whole show doing that. So I think I'm just going to go on and introduce a man who I think his mind is as sharp as his wit, Dr. Francis Beckwith. So, Dr. Beckwith, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me, Nick. I uh, hope I live up to my own reputation. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've heard a whole lot about you academically, but... If my audience hasn't got to hear of you before, tell us a bit about how you got to be doing what you're doing today. Well, you know, I, I, I had always had an interest when I, since I was a little kid in 
kind of big questions. Um, I remember when I was in elementary school, uh, I went to a Catholic elementary school in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I remember always being interested in in questions about the existence of God, the, the uh, who Jesus is, mm-hmm. uh, the nature of the Bible. I, I always had I had this kind of curiosity about all these things, and I was a kind of odd kid for, in that regard. Most of the other kids, uh, they obviously had you know they had some of them had some interest in those questions, but I was kind of annoying about it. <laughs> I would always ask my teachers questions, and I. I would I would used to hang out with adults. You know, I was when I was ten or eleven years old. I remember going to uh, Bible studies and prayer meetings with like forty year olds. Mm-hmm. You know, I so I, I'd always had this kind. I was drawn to these kind of philosophical questions, and that's what uh, eventually led me in college to become a philosophy major, and you know, eventually went on for my doctorate in philosophy at Fordham University and. Mm-hmm. And after that, uh, after my first teaching position at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, I became interested in issues, you know, that, that were a little bit outside of, of religion and, and theology. I became interested in questions of ethics and moral philosophy and politics and law. Mm-hmm. Uh, I began to see connections between what I had learned about uh, philosophy concerning issues about God and religion that were parallel to a certain extent in in law and politics, and uh, I, I began to notice that not many people had actually written on those overlapping interests, and so I began doing more work. Mm-hmm. I first began writing on the abortion controversy, and then mm-hmm. later on issues concerning law, and so that's that. You know, my my interests have changed over the years, but if there's one lodestar that that I've kind of that has helped me in my movement. It's been how best to integrate and think clearly about what it means to be a Christian. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and not only with those sort of typical questions about God and Jesus, which are obviously are important, but what does it mean to say that uh, we should live the Christian life in a society in which most people aren't Christians. Um, how do we do that? How do we do that well? Mm-hmm. And how do we protect mm-hmm. re- protect the church from, let's say, uh, being interfered with unjustly mm-hmm. by secular government? So th- those are th- that's kind of my story. Yeah, I'm kind of curious since you asked all these big questions that when you got to college and you finally wrote your dissertation, what question did you decide to do a dissertation on? Because I'm sure it had to be a difficult choice. Yeah, I, I wrote my doctor's dissertation on David Hume's argument against miracles ah. and con- and contemporary attempts to rehabilitate it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in terms of my own intellectual pilgrimage, that's where I was at. I was really interested in questions about miracles, but I was also interested in questions on the relationship between science and theology. And Hume's challenge to belief in miracles kind of overlap those really well mm-hmm. because in order in order to answer at least I believe in order to answer questions about whether miracles are possible you have to have some idea of what a scientific law is and that gets you into questions of philosophy of science as well as metaphysics mm-hmm. now the irony is that my last chapter in in my doctor's dissertation deals with the question of how how one should assess evidence for miracles and I actually use Legal, the rules of legal evidence as a model mm-hmm. by which to assess uh, 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 miracle mm-hmm. claims, and, and it, that was uh, 11 years before I went to law school. But I, uh, even back then, I guess I had a kind of interest in the law, uh, and it comes out in, in in that part of the dissertation. So that was my ori- my original. I was originally interested in in that. I still have an interest in that, but uh, you know, I've moved to other things since then. Right. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, I know, already know now what to talk about for a second interview sometime. <laughs> but if uh, anyone's interested, also awesome, my question of miracles, I did interview Craig Keener back in 2013 and his book on miracles, which does include some philosophy in there as well. And for science and theology, my interview with James Hannum, who wrote the book God's Philosophers, about the history of science in the Middle Ages. But let's get to the book we're here talking about, yeah. Taking Rights 
seriously. You know, if you are you're listening to this and you're saying, okay, I want to type that into my Google and see what comes up. Make sure you spell it him right. That's R I T E S this time. Why did you call it taking right seriously like that? Well, it's 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 actually a pun. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was a a, 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 a famous book uh, authored by R- R- Ronald Dworkin, who is one of the great philosophers of law, maybe the most influential philosopher of law of the 20th century. And he published a book called Taking Right Seriously, R-I-G-H-T-S. And it's a defense of, of the belief that there are fundamental rights that human beings are entitled to by nature, even though... Dworkin himself would not call himself a natural law thinker. His thinking was that governments ought to follow uh, certain principles of morality in its laws and constitutions. And uh, because of the the fame of that book, uh, I thought, wow, that would be an interesting title. Now, I took the title, so Mm -hmm. I I didn't think of the title. The title is actually... uh, uh, the idea of a professor at uh, University of Notre Dame, he uh, Paul Whiteman, in, in, in I think in the late 1990s, he published an article uh, critical of Dworkin and Rawls, John Rawls, another great philosopher, yeah. and he titled it Taking Right Seriously, R-I-T-E-S, like my book title. And so I, I give him credit in my acknowledgments, but the one thing you can take without violating copyrights is titles. <laughs> so... Uh-huh. I thank I thank Professor Whiteman in my acknowledgments, and I say that because uh, because I take copyright seriously, yeah. um, I I don't have to actually pay him for it, so mm-hmm. um, uh, I'm able to. Uh, but it's it's a it's a it's a it's an attempt to kind of play on Dworkin's book title, but also um, it's obviously what we mean by rights in terms of the context of theology are the practices. Uh, that Christians and other religious believers have that they call rights. Mm -hmm. Um, So something like, uh, we we think of something like maybe like communion or baptism or marriage or a wedding as a a right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. When when somebody prays for a blessing, that's a right. Right. And I I make the argument in the book that these rights, uh, behind them are very important beliefs that people hold and that the way in which secular uh, thinkers typically think of those religious beliefs, I argue they actually don't take rights seriously. Mm-hmm. Now, I know you come at this from a Catholic perspective, but what you say in this book, I want to stress out, works just as well for those of us on the Protestant end. We have our own rights after all, too. That's correct. I mean, you know, anytime you have any sort of ceremony, whether yeah. it's a Sunday service and you have a tradition, and we all, regardless of our denomination, you know, practice what we've been we've inherited right and Mm. so think of something like an altar call that's a kind of right i mean you know it's it's something where 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 people uh, believe they can be reconciled to christ by making a public commitment in fact even backsliders right go to the altar call right because they they believe they can uh they they could be reconciled with the church and with christ this way so yeah we we all do uh, Mm. You know, um, the way we say grace is a kind of right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all these sorts of things that we do. And, we, and the way in which we read scripture, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the way in which our Bibles are divided. All these are, you know, deeply connected with our practices. Mm-hmm. Now, the main thing I started getting out of it when I started reading the book, and I really like the real story because this is something we come across so often, especially in the great big world of the Internet, is the idea that if you are a person, no matter what argument you make, if you are a religious persuasion, your argument is invalid. Yeah. Th- that's right. You have this, this kind of um, attitude that I, I explain in the very beginning of the book by mm-hmm. telling a story. Uh, I'm, I, I spoke a, about thir- it's 13 years ago now at Texas Tech University in, in Abilene, Texas. Not Abilene, I'm sorry. Uh, oh my gosh, where is Lubbock, Texas? Uh, uh, by yeah, the way, Texas Lubbock, Tech University. Yeah, it's in Lubbock, Texas. Yeah. Lubbock, by, by the way, yeah, it, it's such a wasteland there that people from the moon go there and say, what a waste. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, 
Uh, I actually said that. I actually told that joke there, and very few people laughed. It started. Uh, so, um, in any event, so I, I was speaking there, and, and I, I actually was there to talk about my book that had come out just earlier that year called Law, Darwinism, and Public Education. It was about... It was actually based on the dissertation that I wrote for my graduate degree in law at Washington University, mm -hmm. and it dealt with the question of whether uh, one could teach intelligent design in public schools without violating the Constitution's uh, prohibition against religious establishment. And even though I have my I have issues with certain intelligent design arguments uh, for a variety of theological reasons that I actually explain in, in the book, mm -hmm. I think from a legal point of view. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with teaching it. Yeah. Uh, that is to say, I don't think that there's anything unconstitutional. Well, after giving all these arguments, a gentleman in the audience from one of the science departments raises his hand, and he said, all you've given us ha are religious arguments. And I paused for a second, and I said, wow, I'm relieved. I thought that you were going to say they were bad arguments. And the point of the quip was to say wait a second, by putting the adjective religious in front of the word argument doesn't mean you've shown that my arguments are weak or bad or stupid or my mm. premises are false or my inferences don't follow or anything like that. All you've done was to kind of engage in a sort of name calling. Mm. And, and I didn't have to, I mean, obviously I didn't have to actually say that. The audience kind of laughed and he was really mad. I remember him like almost shaking, <laughs> angry, you know. He said, he said I, I don't understand what you're saying. And I said, well, look, um, if I give you an argument, my argument has premises, right? And those premises are either true or false or more probable than not. And, and my premises are used to support a conclusion. Either if it's, a, if it's, a, if it's a, a deductive argument, it's either valid or invalid. Uh, if it's an uh, inductive argument, it's either strong or weak. Um, you know, I said, that's how you evaluate arguments. You don't simply put an adjective in front of it and say, boo, hiss, don't look at that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not the way, I said, that's not the way adults conduct their disagreements in public. And this obviously didn't even, <laughs> it got him even madder. But, you know, this is, this is one of the, I mean, I, I just think, you know, uh, you know, Christians and, and even, you know, non-Christians who, who, you know, let's say Jewish or Muslim uh, believers, have to kind of take control and, mm -hmm. and just tell these people, look, if you don't agree with my arguments, respond to them. But the horse laugh fallacy is not a, an appropriate way to engage disagreement. Yeah. And, and actually, I told the gentleman afterwards, when we privately were having our discussion with several other audience members, I said, look, when you do that, it tells me that you really have a weak case. Mm -hmm. Because the only thing you can do is use adjectives. And I said, that, that, that doesn't bode well for the intellectual credibility of your position. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I said, the reason why you do it is because you can get away with it. You, you have a bunch of people in the audience with whom you already, who already agree with you. But I said, at the end of the day, it really doesn't help you as a person. You know, you're not intellectually more virtuous by being a name caller. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so... But yeah, so I tell that story at the beginning of the book to kind of set it up, to, 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 to tell the reader, look, this is what I'm trying to do in this book. I'm not arguing that every single person who has a position on a public issue who happens to be religious is reasonable. There are unreasonable religious people. Unfortunately. But there are, but there are, but there are also unreasonable, not irreligious people. And mm -hmm. you have to actually get your hands dirty. You actually have to... Mm -hmm investigate and look at the particular argument the person is making not you can't simply paint with a broad brush and say they're all like this because right. re arguments held by people who are Christians and other religious folk are all oh, they're all over the place they, they, they are of a different quality they're different quality they're uh, some of them align well with um, you know certain secular traditions others don't you just have to you can't simply lump them all together. Yeah, and before we go <clears throat> further with uh, something I'd like to say about I'd like to point out something that else that I like about your book when you look at this is you follow that through consistently. Right? <clears throat> there can be an argument that you disagree with its conclusion, but you point out points the argument has got right and where they made a good case 
for that conclusion, even if you disagree with it. And then there are places where you agree with a conclusion, but you think bad arguments were made for that conclusion. And I think that's a great practice we can all learn from. Yeah, that's, you know, that's probably the result of the fact that I've had great teachers over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've learned, I've had many professors that, that I, you know, during my years, both as an undergraduate and graduate school, as well as law school, that were really helpful in, 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 in seeing that, uh, you know, one can have, one can actually believe the right thing for the wrong reasons, or mm -hmm. somebody could actually believe the wrong thing, but have thought through it well. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, yeah. and sometimes it does, uh, brings up some questions about the reasoning of the majority, which, which with I, I agree with the majority's conclusion. But I think that she raises some good counterexamples that I think have to be dealt with. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure that the majority dealt with it well. On the other hand, even though I agree with the majority's conclusion, I think the Hobby Lobby ought to have won. And, they, and I'm glad they did win. I think that Justice Alito does not do a, a service to the position held by Hobby Lobby by treating it as if it's in some ways not accessible to rational uh, investigation. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that there's something that you can learn from both sides in that, in that uh, opinion. Because it looks like then we've set up a just a position between religion and rationality and never which one shall meet. That's exactly right. So, you know, uh, the, my last chapter, I, I, I end, uh, I, I begin my last chapter with a quote from Dallas Willard, uh, who was one of my f favorite philosophers. And actually, I, I'm, more, I'm actually more familiar with Dallas's work as a pastor than as a philosopher. But he did publish this wonderful book in 2009 called Knowing Christ Today, Why We Can Trust Spiritual Knowledge. And for those who, who don't, never heard of Willard, Willard was a Baptist minister who taught philosophy at the University of Southern California, he wrote uh, wonderful books on, on, on Christian spirituality, which was more of his ministerial side. And then he did other books on, uh, he was actually most well known for being an expert on Edmund Husserl, uh, a early 20th century philosopher of phenomenology, and also the professor of numerous Christian philosophers such as J.P. Moreland, and Doug Guyvet, and uh, I think even Greg Bonson, studied with, um, and I know there are many others whose names I, I've forgotten, but in any event, this last book that that, um, that uh, Dallas published was actually interesting because he, he, both sides of Dallas Willard come out in this book, both his philosophical side and his pastoral side. And in the book, he talks about how, he talks about the separation of church and state, and he says what's happened over generations is that the separation of church and state has kind of morphed into a kind of separation of faith and reason. And when, when I read that in 2009, when I, when I bought the book, and I thought, wow, that's really powerful. And, and as I began reading more court cases, when I, I teach a course at Baylor called Law and Religion in the United States, and obviously when new cases are issued by the court, that actually was always in the back of my mind, and it was really helpful when I was putting this book together. Uh, I began working on it in 2008, and um, when Willard's comments came out in that book, I thought I had actually changed the way that I began focusing on the different chapters. So um, in any event, I think that's right, Nick, that that mm -hmm. that the way in which people talk about religion, uh, uh, they, they, it's almost as if uh, so. So the, they're giving an, an example. So let's talk about the, the, the something that may be on the mind of many of your um your listeners, the, the uh, recent cases the Supreme Court has dealt with concerning the health and human resources mandate, the HHS mandate, that was part of a regulation issued by the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services that required that all health care plans include in them uh, contraceptive and birth control of a wide variety. Some of those birth control uh, pr uh, products um, <laughs> and methods include drugs that some of us believe, and actually the science I think supports this, mm -hmm. may result in early abortions. That is to say the fertilized egg, the early embryo is destroyed rather than fertilization being prevented. Mm -hmm. So some people sued the uh, Health, and Human, Health and Human Services Secretary uh, saying that this violated their 
their um, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That is, that this uh, placed a substantial burden on these businesses that violated their religious liberty. Well, it's interesting that if you look at the way people talk about this, like in certain magazines like The New Republic or Slate, uh, they'll still talk, they'll talk about, well, this is, ju- this is their religious belief. And, of course, health has to do with what? Medicine. And medicine has to do with science. And science mm-hmm. is based on reason, yeah. right? On the other yeah. hand, uh, Hobby Lobby and the um, uh, Little Sisters of the Poor and other uh, agencies and groups that, that mm-hmm. filed lawsuits, they're appealing to their faith or their religion. And, of course, religion is based on faith. And faith is not the same as reason. So what this debate is about is really faith versus reason. And in that war, reason should win all the time because faith has nothing to do with reason. <clears throat> and that, that's, that's the kind of narrative that I think that people don't consciously think through, but I think that's what's doing the work. And so one of the points that I try to make in the book is that on a lot of these issues, it really isn't a dispute between faith and reason. Now, it is in one sense, right? So as Christians, we believe that our faith teaches that unborn human beings are made in the image of God and ought, to be, ought not to be killed without justification, and which right. is in virtually every case, right? That's our, our belief. We think we, we learn that from the scriptures, and, and many of us will argue that we learn it from the way in which um, our church may teach how to think about issues in bioethics. Right. On the other hand, though, many of us also believe that we have really good, you know, reasons for this, apart from what Scripture and tradition teaches. This is something right. that we, we think, and in fact, there are some atheists that are against abortion. In fact, I came across a website the other day, Secular Arguments Against Abortion. It's, it's run by this atheist guy, and he quotes my work all the time. There's it's a secular pro life alliance out yeah, there. Yeah, so, so it's pretty cool. So, yeah. so... So, so my point is that that dispute, let's say over abortion or the dispute about uh, contraception and whether some of contraception results in the death of of embryos, mm-hmm. is really a matter mm-hmm. of two different understandings of reason. Mm-hmm. That is to say, you have one understanding uh, or one set of arguments that says that unborn human beings are not full fledged members of the human community. Another set of arguments says, yes, they are. This is the position I hold and many people hold. And then we argue that, you know, it turns out that obviously this is supported by our religious tradition, but that's not the entirety of our case. Um, Mm -hmm. I I would even say that you can extend this to arguments about God's existence, right? Or or even I use this example of the debate about the Pledge of Allegiance. (laughs) That is, you know, there were certain people that didn't want uh, their children who are in public school to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And they actually have a right to excuse themselves, but they also objected that the Pledge of Allegiance was recited at all by anybody because it has the phrase under God. Now, if you look at when that phrase was inserted in the pledge, it was inserted in 1954 by the United States Congress, and they inserted it in there because they wanted to distinguish of the American understanding of rights and their origin from the Soviet understanding of rights. The Soviets believed, because they were materialist atheists, that rights came from government. American uh, tradition teaches that rights don't come from government, they come from God, and that God, and for that reason, uh, our rights are not invented or created by us, they are actually discovered by us, and that just governments ought to honor those rights. Now, now, there are a lot of people who disagree with that, right? There are atheists who disagree with that understanding, but the, the, the difference between the two camps doesn't rest on faith. It rests on philosophical arguments on the nature of rights and whether rights require God. Right. This is an argument that you find that goes all the way back to Plato, that you can find in authors like Cicero, that are picked up by people like Augustine and Aquinas. And then in our present age, my, my late friend, uh, my ex- deceased friend, Louis Poyman, who was mm. you know, not a Christian, but a theist, who, made the, who offered an argument in 1991 as to why rights require the existence of God. So, so, this, you know, so my point is that the way you understand these disputes or look at them is not as faith versus reason, but two different and contrary understandings of reason and what we can discover through reason. And that, I think, in a, in a, non, in a government, in a non-theocracy, and we live in a non-theocracy, 
ought to be open to all those kinds of arguments because they're all deliverances of human reason. <clears throat> you know, and I was thinking a counterpart to what you're talking about to look at the other side is the event that takes place in D.C. now known as the Reason Rally where atheists and secularists will get together and they participate in what I call presupposition or atheism where it's like, because I am an atheist, I am therefore rational. And therefore, since I'm rational, all my arguments are rational. And yeah. so people can pick up a book like The God Delusion, oh my gosh, this is so good. I mean, anyone, even atheists, who have any clue whatsoever about philosophy, look and say, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. and, and But it, it's assumed if you are rational, you automatically know that Christianity is false, that gods don't exist, that miracles can't happen, and there was no argument, it was just assume I'm an atheist, therefore I'm rational. Yeah. Now, of course, as you know, Nick, and you know, having yourself been involved with apologetics and philosophy for a while, yeah. you know, when people talk, uh, bring up, you know, say something like, like, like these atheists are saying, you think to yourself, well, wait a second, reason, what the heck is reason, and what does reason know, right? Yeah. So. So this is an example I use with my students at Baylor and I've used in a couple of lectures over the years. I say, look, if you look outside and there are five trees, how many things do you know? Well, you know that there are five trees, but isn't there a sixth thing you know? Treeness, mm -hmm. right? Now, where's treeness? It's not something that's empirically observed. It's a concept, right? Mm -hmm. But it's an intelligible concept, right? It's, just, it's something that's more than the material world that you're observing, right? So, mm -hmm. so reason then, seems to me, leads to the belief that there are immaterial realities. Now, we can debate about whether those realities can exist outside or inside the mind, right? Uh, I know my friend Bill Craig has a view different than mine uh, on this. Uh, he has his doubts about abstract entities, but, or abstract, uh, but, um, but so, but regardless of that, they're, they're concepts, and concepts they don't take up space. Uh, they don't, um, you can't observe them, but yet we know them. So reason itself seems to lead to the conclusion that there are immaterial realities that we can know, but in order to be a, an atheist, or at least the kind of sort that we, we know of today, you have to believe in materialism. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it seems to me that there's, you're right, there's a lot of kind of um, uh, living mm -hmm. off the borrowed capital of a metaphysics that you don't believe exists, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so, you know, you, you, you're taking all this stuff for granted. Um, another example I use uh, with my students is uh, circumference equals two pi radius, right? So right. Uh, if, if there's a, if you, if there's a, if I'm going to cut, let's say a tree uh, that, 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 you know, that almost looks like it's, you know, circular, has a circular trunk, um, you know what, if there were no trees and there was no universe, that would still be true. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so there has to be, so, so there are, and of course, there actually is never a perfect circle in the material world, right? right. Uh, there's no perfect triangle. So, so, so when we look at everything that's circular in the world, whether it's uh, in the physical world, whether it's my basketball or, or a hula hoop or something like that, not one of them perfectly exemplifies circularity. Mm -hmm. So circularity is not the same as anything known in the empirical world. In fact, if the entire empirical world vanished tomorrow, circularity would still be circularity. So that means that there are immaterial realities that have to exist in some mind that's always existed. Yeah. Now, I, now I know that some people don't find those arguments persuasive. I kind of I love those kind of conceptual arguments. That's just me. I guess I'm a closet platonist. I, I down deep, right? Uh, but the point is, here's my point: is that these atheists who show up at these reason rallies clearly have never thought this through, right? I mm -hmm. mean, there's all these problems with this kind of naive materialist empiricism. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it, it's all when you were talking about the five trees and you were saying, what's something else you have to know? I, I thought of the concept of treeness, but I was also saying, well, you have to know what the idea of five is as well. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> That's right, yeah. and you and you don't actually see five, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, act, you what you what you see are the trees. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think that's really hurt us today is the combination of materialism and the computer, 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, you hear people say, well, the mind is like a computer. And, of course, that's a metaphor, right? So right. we always have to then come up with some mm-hmm. – we, so anything that our mind happens to know has to fit what we think computers do. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of weird because our minds, yeah, we, we do compute, but that's not the only thing it does. Mm-hmm. Right? It, it can know concepts. It can actually encounter transcendent things like mm-hmm. the good, the true, and the beautiful. Right. Right. Uh, we've lost a lot of that. And, and yet it kind of comes out, right? It comes out in those more candid moments when, when we look at, let's say, that beautiful landscape and we say that's beautiful, right? And we just, we mm-hmm. can't really put it into words. It's almost indescribable. But if some guy came up to us, let's say, with a, uh, a metal detector and he, sa- and, he, and he pointed the metal detector at the mountain and he says, well, I can't detect beauty, so it must not be real, right? We would say that he's weird. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's um, it's uh, the age that we live in. Kind of some sometimes hampers us from seeing what should be obvious. Yeah. Whenever I hear someone who's <clears throat> advocating a position of uh, of subjective beauty that you know beauty is only in the eye of a beholder and such, I just look at them and say, okay, just a simple question here. Is your wife truly beautiful, or is that just an idea you're putting on her? <laughs> yeah, oh, you do. Yeah, don't do that in front. Do it in front of the wife. You're sure to get the <laughs> the answer you want to hear, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you know the, mm-hmm. the interesting thing about that is that you know the person that offers that, mm-hmm. and I don't know if you've thought about this before, but it's something I, I've thought about. They're assuming there's a kind of elegance to their argument, are they not? Yeah. Right. I mean, so, 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 I mean, but elegance is a concept. It's an aesthetic judgment, right? Mm-hmm. So, you, you see this all the time, right? I mean, I, I, we all, for those of us who've studied philosophy or have read theology, that time, that moment when you read somebody and it all crystallizes. Oh yeah. And you go, oh, and you get mm-hmm. it, and yeah. and there's something. So, if you showed the same argument to somebody, the same sort of the the propositions written down, on mm-hmm. ink and paper, they're not gonna, they may not get it. So there's something more to the ink and paper mm-hmm. than just the ink and paper, right? There's something to, more to the argument than just the ink and paper. And it's that elegance, right? That, ele- that beauty, yeah. right? And, and, and you say, aha. I mean, this is an experience we get when, when, when a certain song is played, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's something I, I, I'm not, I'm not an, I don't specialize in aesthetics, but it's something that, that really intrigues me is why is it that beauty does this to us? Yeah. Right. And it's and it's something I think Christian philosophers have not explored uh, in a way that as an you know just as an apologetic. I think it's something that is rich for mining. You know, something that we we we've ignored. But if you look at the classics, you know, the cla- the great thinkers in, in in the early church and medieval times, that was something that they found to be compelling. You know, one thing that. I used to bring this home to people when I talk about it, <clears throat> is I say, if we're going to think in purely material terms and such, then I'd like you to consider what it would mean if you describe sexual intimacy in only physical terms using your best Ben Stein robotic voice whatsoever. And you just <laughs> describe it, people would say, oh, what's, what's the big deal about that? But if yeah. you leave out that and you start talking about what's really going on, if there's something that transcends the physical, then I was like, oh, that makes a difference. Well, you know, David Hume has this, uh, I think, sophistic, uh, sophist, this argument of sophistry, where he does that with murder. Mm-hmm. He says, he says, I can, you know, I can describe a murder this way, and he goes through, you know, uh, you know, showing the, the man is pulling the trigger and the bullet leaves the chamber and at a certain velocity hits the flesh, blah, blah, blah. And he says, I, I, in that description, there is no wrongness or murder. So therefore, that isn't real. And he says, it's no different than when a, a large tree, uh, let's say, grows in a way to destroy its sapling. It's simply a kind of mechanistic description of nature. Now, you know, what he's doing there is very similar to the person that looks at the beautiful mountain range and holds up his metal detector. Mm-hmm. He's excluding from the picture the very thing that makes his claim about metaphysics false. And that's mm-hmm. called begging the question. Mm-hmm. And so by saying, well, you know, my uh, purely physical account of this killing doesn't 
give you murder, um, you know, that's because a purely physical count won't do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that, you know, that's exactly right, but that's not how we discover morality. Right. So, yeah, and it's really weird, the influence of people. I mean, I did my dissertation on Hume, and in one sense I have great respect for Hume, but in another sense, I, I think he's tremendously overrated yeah. <laughs> as a philosopher, and I think he was one of those guys, like, the right place at the right time, right? Um, you know, yeah. he, you know there, there was a culture that was looking for someone to say exactly what he was, gonna, was saying, but I don't think he was particularly great. I, I think you compare him to, to someone like a Thomas Aquinas or an Augustine, and he's a lightweight. Uh, I, I, I think that you're familiar with uh, John Ehrman's book, Hume's Abject Failure. Yes, yes. I, and, and he, it's, a, it's a better critique of Hume than mine. Uh, I, I remember when I read it, I thought, you know, darn, I wish I, wish I had, you know, thought of some of those things. Uh, it's a really good book, yeah. Yeah. Etienne Gerson, as we to have said, that when he read uh, G.K. Chesterton's biography of Thomas Aquinas, he hated it. He said, I hate it because I've studied Aquinas for 50 years and I could not write a book that good. Yeah. <laughs> now, you yeah. used a term here a few times here, and I'd like to see if you can explain it for the audience, because if someone's not philosophically minded, it's when they've heard, but they don't really know what it means, and most atheists would say, oh, I'm actually... Whenever that term comes up, it's rubbish, and that's the term metaphysics. Uh -huh. Yeah, metaphysics, I mean, literally, it just means beyond the physical. Mm -hmm. That is, that's the, literally from the Greek. Uh, it actually refers to, you know, the way, questions that philosophers try to answer about the ultimate nature of things. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, let's say we were talking earlier about the, the, the nature of rights. Mm -hmm. uh, what are rights? Uh, mm -hmm. Are I mean, they, they seem to be things, but are they things like um, plants and animals? Are they things like boxes and rocks? Well, no, they, they boxes, boxes and rocks and animals take up space. Uh, so what are they? Are they simply kind of fictions that we think of? Are they like the colors of the traffic signals? Mm -hmm. You know, we, the fact that we pick red, green, and amber... You know, it could have been blue, yellow, and pink, right? You know, right. what's the difference? So, so that, that's a metaphysical question. What is the reality of what, you know, um, what does it really mean to say there are rights? Now, when it comes to human beings, um, when we ask questions about what is, what is a human being, and um, you say, well, you can point to a human being, and you say, well, there's a human being. Well, that's, that's, a, uh, that's not, a, that's not a, a real definition, right? It's, right. A, it's a connotation, right? You're just simply pointing towards it. But a real definition would be something like what Aristotle said, a human being is a rational animal. Mm -hmm. That is, we have animality, mm -hmm. we also have the power to reason. So that's a metaphysical account of the human person. Now, a lot of people are going to dispute um, whether a human being is always a rational animal. There are people today that are philosophical materialists that will say, well, rationality is a power had by persons and when a human being lacks, let's say, the ability to exercise their reason, either because they're too young or too ill, they're a human being, but they're not a person. So that's a metaphysical, you know, how do we you know, figure this out? So, uh, yeah, so metaphysical questions are questions about sort of the ultimate meaning and understanding of what things are. Yeah. You know, and um, and you're going to have obviously different people holding different views, but that's what metaphysics is. Now, if you go to a bookstore, it is a sometimes it's a metaphysical section, and it's all about Ouija boards and crystal balls and tarot cards. But that's not what philosophers are dealing mm -hmm. with. They're dealing right. with, you know, more technical issues. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get into the meat of what we're talking about and the whole idea comes that if someone has a religious persuasion to something that you know they're automatically wrong and such <clears throat> I'm wondering how does this apply at the start to Joe public out there who's taking a stance on an issue and at the only time all he can say is where here's what the Bible says and that's what I agree with that's what I see as authoritative and how, how should we look at such a claim well, you know, it depends on the claim that you're making. So mm -hmm. let's say, you know, again, it's, it's, uh, I think on all these questions, you have to 
the gr- the greater specificity, the easier it is to deal with. So, mm-hmm. if somebody, let's say you're 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 arguing about an issue like abortion, and they and they say, well, you know, your position is just religious, and you go, well, what do you mean? What do you mean by religious? Well, you know, you it's because your 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 religious tradition teaches it, or the Bible teaches it, and you know, you know, with the issue of abortion. Now, that's an interesting issue because uh, I think you can make the argument that Scripture actually prohibits. Uh, the intentional killing of unborn children, uh, although it's not explicit, it's, it's, you have to sort of make an argument to it. I think you can you can show easily, given the way in which the early church dealt with um, infanticide and abortion in the in the Roman Empire. Clearly, that's the way the church had always thought about abortion. But but having said that, are there are there arguments that people make? against abortion that do not explicitly appeal to scripture and the answer is yes of course yes. of course and they and they appeal they make all sorts of arguments they appeal to scientific reasoning they will oftentimes uh, supplement their scientific reasoning by philosophical arguments and of mm-hmm. course the irony is that's exactly how the other side argues right so so somebody who let's say is for abortion rights will say well in some at least some advocates will say well I agree with you pro-lifer that the uh, unborn is a human being but it's not a person because we can't engage in these particular activities mm-hmm. and that then, then you're off and running right so mm-hmm. the, the, the difference here is between two different understandings of the nature of the human person now clearly Christians are shaped and informed by their theological beliefs mm-hmm. but that's no, that's no less true with the secularists in terms of their form mm-hmm. and shaped by their metaphysical beliefs that is mm-hmm. if they're materialists and they believe that the human being is simply you know a material entity and that um, what makes you valuable is not the matter that you're made out of but you know your consciousness and your ability to reason well those are those are philosophical beliefs that answer the exact same questions that the theological beliefs answer Mm -hmm. so I so it depends on the issue now something like you know same-sex marriage uh, there, you know, I think it's it's it, it's different because uh, clearly within Christianity, uh, marriage is central uh, in, in ways that you know the issue of abortion is is not central, right? Uh, right. So you know, what is what is the metaphor that is most frequently used to describe the church in Scripture? The bride of Christ, mm-hmm. right? Um, the analogies with Christ and his church is, is marital, right? Mm-hmm. Um, marriage is something Jesus specifically addresses, right? Mm-hmm. About divorce and remarriage and what adultery is, right? Mm-hmm. And he says it's from the beginning that a man shall, that a woman shall leave her, you know, her, her, her parents and, be, and cling to her, to her husband, right? Mm-hmm. And the two shall yeah. become one. Yeah. Uh, so these are all so, so marriage clearly and of course in, in certain Christian traditions like mine uh, as a Catholic we believe marriage is a sacrament so do the Eastern Orthodox so there, so there is something here that is mm-hmm. deeply theological on the other hand though when Christians appropriate marriage they're not they're not creating something that didn't exist yeah. <laughs> so, so basically what, what, what the church did uh, was inherent marriage, obviously, from its Jewish predecessors, but also marriages occurred in the Roman Empire, right? People were married, right? right. Uh, Plato talks about marriage. Aristotle talks about marriage and families, right? So, so there's something about marriage and families that isn't strictly biblical, right? And that mm-hmm. has to do with the nature of human beings, and that's the way people understood marriage for quite some time, even in cultures that had no encounter with Scripture or the Bible or the Jewish tradition or the Christian tradition. They, they understood marriage as something arising from the nature of men and women. And what mm-hmm. is their nature? Their nature is, is in fact, uh, mo- uh, put it this way, every man and every woman is, in fact, a potential mother or father, even if they're sterile, right? Yeah. Because that's the way to, th- that their reproductive powers are ordered, even when those reproductive hours, uh, 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 reproductive powers are defective, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. and so the, this institution arises precisely for that reason. Yeah. Right. So now now obviously you're going to have some people who who are going to you know you know disagree with that understanding, but it's not something that's crazy or irrational. It's something that arose everywhere as a consequence of the way in which human beings are in fact designed. Mm-hmm. Right. So so yeah, you're going to have. Um, 
and it's interesting, even cultures where, let's say, homosexuality was less frowned upon, uh, let's say Greek culture or even Roman culture and society, nobody thought that those unions were actually marital, mm -hmm. right? And, and, right. And, and had a lot to do with their understanding of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, I think today, uh, because of um, the advancements in technology in which we've been able to separate reproduction um, from sex in radical ways, that I think our consciousness has actually shifted where people no longer think of sex as intrinsically ordered towards reproduction. Mm -hmm. So I think that has something to do with that. Uh, also, because of that, uh, non-marital uh, or you know, sexual acts outside of marriage uh, become less risky in terms of reproduction. And so that also lowers our sort of, or kind of averts our gaze at uh, our natures and so we, we tend to we tend to be you know let's say more skeptical of this more ancient understanding but the ancient understanding is not crazy or ludicrous or insane it's it's a perfectly reasonable thing to believe yeah. given the nature of men and women and so I do think again you know to go back to your initial question it's going to depend on the issue yeah. right and and, and 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 the specificity of the question you know when, when you were speaking here the whole time as I'm sitting here at my desk, I probably like many of her husbands in this world, I got a picture of my wife Allie right here on my computer desk here and I'm looking over time to time hearing you talk about the good of marriage and saying, yep, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. And yeah, I'm looking over it from time to time anyway, regardless. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I was part of a discussion on a Facebook group just recently and someone's asking okay does anyone have any reasonable reason why we shouldn't let homosexuals get married and such and so i just asked one simple question up oh boy what is marriage and that was geez you know i hadn't thought about that kind of thing i said okay so let me give it straight you don't know what marriage is you haven't thought about it but you think we should give it to homosexuals yeah and then often they say well marriage is just a, con a personal relationship, a contract between two people. Say, okay, why can't two roommates be married? Why can't two business partners call what they yeah. have a marriage? I mean, you've lowered marriage for everyone, and it is especially amusing when someone said that a marriage can be usually sexual. Yeah. But, oh, okay, so now you got to a part where you totally separated sex from marriage. That, that just blows my mind that you say that. Yeah, I mean, what what if two people? Let's supposing me and my 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 buddy Alden. I have a colleague, Alden Smith. He's just in the classics department at Baylor. We play mm -hmm. basketball with a couple of about fifteen or twenty other guys every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the gym at Baylor. And supposing I told Alden, I I, I, I what if Alden and I wanted to get married, and but w the way we consummated our union was by playing one on one basketball. You know, mm -hmm. we you know we just simply we, we you know we played a game and that was it. Now, people could laugh at that and think that's ridiculous, but it's not clear why it has to be romantic or even in any way sexual. Right. Why? I mean, on what grounds? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, why couldn't we receive all the benefits of, uh, of the, that the state is giving to people? We just want to be roommates. We like mm -hmm. to play ball together. Yeah. We may even want to date women, right? So I'm assuming we're single, but we still want to be married. Mm -hmm. what, in principle could you, what principle could you offer against that? Yeah. And, you know, you're right. I mean, once, uh, once you start detaching marriage from what have traditionally been considered its essential characteristics, and that those were permanence, exclusivity, and conjugality. That yeah. is to say, marriage is a permanent union between two people, um, uh, and it's exclusive in the sense that it's chaste. That is to say, nobody is only the two people in the, in the marriage that can have sex with each other. And, of course, conjugality refers to that. The, yeah. act, the conjugal act, yeah. right? And so this is why, uh, by the way, um, before um, New York uh, was the first state, I believe, that, that actually through legislation permitted same-sex marriage, um, they actually had to change their adultery. They had to change their law about no-fault divorce because one of the grounds for uh, divorce was um, sexual intercourse with someone not your spouse. But under 
the common law definition, sexual intercourse is in fact the conjugal act between a man and a woman. It's mm. not it's not any yeah. way you can get an orgasm. Yeah. That's not necessarily without getting into graphic detail. That's not a conjugal act. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you, just like if I, if I were to put an ashtray in my mouth and swallow it, it would not make the act eating or the ashtray food. Yeah. Right? So, so, you know, so, so it's interesting. A week, a couple of weeks before, it might have been a week before, New York actually changes no fault divorce law because mm -hmm. they understood that if you had same sex marriage, in theory, a a non-marital act could not be adulterous. <laughs> yeah. Right? Or a right. non-conjugal act in which you use your sexual powers would not be adulterous. Now, here you've got actually, I mean, there you've got deep metaphysical questions, right, mm -hmm. about our sexual powers, the way to which they're ordered, and so forth. And, um, yeah, I mean, even the legislature in under, uh, New York understood that. Yeah, I mean, even if we look at Something more recent, such as uh, Obama's edict about transgender students and such. Most people, are, they're not serious metaphysicians who study philosophy and such. They just look and say, um, I don't know this philosophy, but I know how to tell what a man is. I know how to tell what a woman is. And they just don't belong in each other's bathrooms. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a difficult issue. I don't think it's a difficult issue in terms of the law. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think it's difficult in the sense that we've we've reached a point in our in the history in, in our culture where mm -hmm. where people have have uh, many people have accepted the idea that whatever you believe about yourself cannot be in principle challenged. Mm -hmm. Now, if people though only seem to use that when it comes to sexual morals, right? So, yeah. if I believe, for example, that I was Napoleon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people would say, clearly you're not Napoleon, here's some empirical evidence, you know, this is Napoleon's grave, mm -hmm. you know, and so forth. Uh, but when it comes to these issues concerning gender, oddly enough, people think that, that just claiming it yeah. is good enough. Um, the other thing that I think, you know, and the other thing I think we have to be as Christians very clear here, and, and that, you know, people that are, that are, you know, going through these, a cascade of emotions about gender and who they really are, and yeah. people that we should love yeah. and care for, and and, and they're people. There are people that I've known over the years. I, I I knew a gentleman in the early 1980s who underwent the, a surgical sex change, and then as he was a man, and he uh, went a trans went into transgender surgery uh, to become a woman, or you know physically appear, cosmetically appear like to a woman. Mm -hmm. And he, he regretted it and came back and attended church with me. My wife and I went to a small four-square church in, in Las Vegas. And he was a dear, dear person. And he struggled with this. And I was so proud of the church for not, you know, alienating him, right? He showed up originally dressed up, you know, like a woman, mm -hmm. right? And, and people embraced him and, and welcomed him. And so, so I mean, I, I want to make it clear here that that you know, we, we deal with the philosophical issues, which are really important. We have to also remember there are real persons here that need to be loved. Not, not, I don't, I don't believe that their that their beliefs should be um, honored in the sense that we should agree with them, but we should remember mm. that these are people that are going through great struggles, and that they are people that 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 for whom Christ died, and and all of us to a certain extent uh, struggle with questions of identity, right, and, mm. and particular types of sins. Uh, so we have to be, you know, I think sensitive to that. Was that man by any chance Walt Heyer? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I, I for, frankly forget his name. It was, I think, between 81 and 84. Okay, because that sounds a lot like his story, and we interviewed him on the show a couple of weeks ago about transgender issues. Yeah, he may have. I mean, if he lived in Las Vegas, I mean, the odds are pretty good that he may be the same, the same gentleman. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... You know, I'm thinking with the whole identity thing. I mean, I study New Testament very, very seriously, but I, I can just imagine the reaction I get if I knocked on my doors of Baylor University where you teach and say, well, I believe I have a, I'm a PhD in New Testament. That's how I identify, so you should seriously consider me for teaching. Or you'd probably yeah. seriously consider me for a few other things instead. Yeah, yeah that's right. Well, yeah, that's spe right. Speaking along those lines, we're talking with uh, Dr. Francis Beckwith this week about his book, Taking Life Seriously. But if you're interested in New Testament studies, 
Next week, we've got an interesting show, a topic we haven't really looked at before. We're going to be talking about the apostles. What happened to them? Because we often hear us saying, you know, no one would die for a lie. And say, well, we all know the apostles were all martyred for their faith, except for maybe John. Well, what's the evidence for that case? How good is it? I'm going to be talking with someone who did their Ph.D., on the fate of the apostles has their book on out and that's sean mcdowell if you're familiar with josh mcdowell this is his son sean we're going to be talking about his book the fate of the apostles next week but now let's get back to dr beckwith here you know something that would probably surprise a lot of christians and the first time i encountered this kind of concept it surprised me is that you write against the intelligent design I remember the first time I heard on Unbelievable that there was going to be a debate between two Christians on intelligent design. And it, it kind of blew my mind because I was of the opinion of thinking, I thought all Christians believed in intelligent design. How can you be a Christian and not believe in intelligent design? But it, it really is possible. And I've come to be skeptical of the movement some myself. And for me, the same reason you are. Could you tell us, why it is your skeptical of the movement? First off, what do you think the movement is? Sure, I, that's a you know it's, a, it's a, I want to clarify a few things though before okay. I directly answer that. One sure. is obviously as Christians we believe that the universe is designed. Yeah. So so there's there's no dispute there. Um, uh, that is you know obviously we believe that God created everything. Mm. Uh, he not only brought the universe into existence, he sustains it in existence. That he created all the living mm. creatures in it. Those creatures have uh, natures, and those natures tell us about the, what they're ordered towards. And there are, uh, there's, so there's no doubt in my mind that as Christians we ought to believe the universe is designed. Right. Now, what I'm critical of is um, the intelligent design movement, which is not the same as believing in intelligent design. In mm -hmm. design. Now, uh, another caveat that's really important. I have some very dear friends that are in that movement. I respect them tremendously. I've worked with them. They've contributed to books I've edited. I've contributed to things that they've done. I've had several of them as graduate students at Baylor, one of whom uh, I served on his doctoral committee. <laughs> so there, there are people who I really respect who, who defend intelligent design. My critique has to do with not so much whether the arguments work or not, and this is going to sound odd because a lot of one of the critiques of, of my critique has been, well, don't you think, don't, doesn't it matter whether the arguments work? And for the type of critique I'm offering, that's not entirely relevant. And I'll ex let me explain why. Mm -hmm. um, the way in which some intelligent design advocates argue for their position is something like this. Uh, uh, for example, Bill Dembski argues that. Um, when we look at nature, when we, we see certain phenomena, we can ex the one thing to figure out whether something is designed or has the earmark of, of design is to exclude both chance and law, mm -hmm. and then whatever remains, if it's at a certain high degree of improbability, uh, we can infer that it was the, the consequence of a mind. And he uses several examples like. Um, um, let's say the odds of somebody, let's say, getting, you know, this is actually, I think this is my example. Uh, it may not be bills. It's in, you know, let's say, you, you know, gets like 40, uh, you know, perfect poker hands in a row or something like that. You know, you, you realize there has to be some cheating going on, right? right. Uh, or somebody that happens to publish a book where 20 pages in a row are identical to another 20 pages, right? So we think that you know those are plagiarized right you can't say well what a coincidence we happen to write the same thing okay right. those are all the examples that are used and, and of course there are examples in nature that seem to be as improbable like um, example that Michael B he uses the bacterial flagella mm -hmm. uh, now my problem I, is, a, is a theological problem uh, as a Christian and as a theist I believe that that God designed not only bacterial flagellum but also the chance in the law. Right. And so what, what, what I think it teaches to people like Richard Dawkins and the New Atheists and other folks who may be sort of in between is that theists and atheists are fighting over this real thin sliver of turf 
the bacterial flagellum and other sorts of things that simply can't be explained or um, you know other let's say biological or um, natural phenomena that hasn't been given a, an account based on law or chance and mm-hmm. I think that I think that's giving away too much turf to the other side mm-hmm. I, I, I think and, and again it, it may very well be that the and it, well, supposing the arguments do work uh, supposing um, let's say Behe's arguments work and um, and Dembski's arguments work I think the best they show is that Darwinian evolution as a theory may not be able to account for all natural phenomena but that's not but I, I think that that's not an argument from which you can infer a a designer the sort of designer that I'm con- that as a Christian I care about that is the designer of the universe mm-hmm and I think God is not like creatures in the universe. God uh, is not a substitute for scientific theories. Uh, if God does become a, sub- a substitute for scientific theories, I think God moves from transcendent to imminent. And I think that does great damage to our understanding of divine action. Uh, God doesn't need space in creation to act. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, that's my... You know my, you know in a nutshell my critique. Again, I have I have great respect for some of my friends, all of my friends in the intelligent design movement, uh, but I think that they're they're teaching the wrong lesson about the nature of God and divine action, and um, you know so more power to them. I mean I think you know I I do think, and here you know I will defend them. I do think that the way that many of them have been treated. Uh, especially Bill Dembski when he was uh, hired here at Baylor there were many people that came out against him in ways that were unfair and uncivil and I and I'm not defending those people um, right. I think you know but I, I, I as a theory I, I, I have issues and those issues are theological and, and I, I articulate them in in taking rights seriously but I'm also quite critical of, of the other side um, I think that there's a way by which we can talk about design that makes sense without, I think, falling for, I think, some of the problems that I've already mentioned with intelligent design reasoning. I actually came to the conclusions that I've come to while a student at SES, which I'm sure would be surprising to some people, you were yeah. there and then you came to that conclusion? Yeah, I was. Because <laughs> I had to take a class on general apologetics, which for me was, that was basic stuff because I've been doing this for years. And I said, you know, I think it'd be interesting for my class project to be a paper on science and religion and the relationship. And I noticed that it looked like, if you look at, for instance, Bill Craig's five ways, for instance, so many of them depended on modern scientific knowledge and having to have all that, but there has to be a better way. I mean, people had good reasons for being theists before science came along. And of course, at SES, you get the five ways of Aquinas, and I got those, and so I started looking and said, you know, could I take anything from science and use it for you? I mean, let's suppose the universe was eternal. Let's suppose there was a multiverse. Could I work that into the Thomistic argument? Well, yeah, I could. Let's suppose that biological evolution of the degree talked about by Dawkins and Evers, a of materialistic aspect, let's suppose it's true. Can that work with my position? Well, yeah, it can. And that, to me, was a huge eye-opener, because now I'll go to an atheist and they sort of debate about the existence of God, and the first thing they want to pull out is the evolution card, and this is a Trump card, now you're finished. And um, Okay, tell you what, I'm yeah. going to grant you evolution for the sake of argument, give me your real position. And I think part of it then is because it becomes that when we start there, we automatically seem to concede to the atheist that exactly. science is the arbiter. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I, I give a lecture at, at at Summit Ministries, which I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not sure how many of your listeners are familiar with Summit. Uh, it's a summer camp for Christian kids that I've been doing for 20 years, and I'll mm-hmm. be going out in a couple of weeks. Uh, one of the lectures I give is called the Five Campus Dogmas. Mm-hmm. And one of the dogmas I go over is the claim that Darwinism has refuted belief in design. Yes. And I tell the students, I said, we're not going to discuss here whether Darwinism is, you know, whether, you know, arguments for or against Darwinism. 
Yeah. I'm just going to grant for the sake of argument that Darwinism is true. If it's true, does it refute design? And the interesting thing is that, you know, when you go through and you, and you present it to these kids, they, they get that kind of aha moment. Like, like wow. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. So, so, for example, supposing natural selection working on random mutation is true that, for the development of the species. Well, first off, you need a universe with order in it for even that to occur. Right, you need mm -hmm. laws, and those laws themselves can't be accounted for by laws. Uh, it would be like this: imagine somebody were to say, "Well, you know, um, um, you know, uh, evolution is like uh, rolling dice. Really, it's like rolling dice. But dice uh, have a certain shape and form to them. There are no, there are, there are dots on them indicating one, two, three, four, five, six. It presupposes order, mm -hmm. right?" So, so, and think about this, another one you usually hear is, well, given enough time, uh, a, a million monkeys on a million typewriters are going to, you know, pump out uh, to be or not to be. First off, you need monkeys. <laughs> mm -hmm. Secondly, you need typewriters, both of which are ordered. And then you have to have the idea in your mind of Hamlet. So, all of, so basically, all these scenarios presuppose an orderly backdrop. Mm -hmm. Now, none of these are scientific arguments that I'm offering. They're philosophical arguments, right? Yeah. And they're philosophical arguments that, uh, that don't in any way uh, require any scientific arguments, but they are the kind of arguments that show that certain philosophical assumptions make science possible. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk about summit ministries, the main reason I know about summit is from seeing Mike Adams' Facebook page. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I assume you hate Mike Adams also. <laughs> I don't own that bumper sticker. <laughs> I know that, you know, he, he was giving those away when I was there. But I'll see him this summer a couple of times. <laughs> well, the thing is that when you dialogue with atheists today, science is automatically played as the trump card to everything. And then I've got this quote from Stephen Meyer that you have in your book. And this is a long one, so bear with me, audience. But for two millennia, the design argument provided an intellectual foundation for much of Western thought. From classical antiquity through the rise of modern science, leading philosophers, theologians, and scientists, from Plato to Aquinas to Newton, maintain that nature manifests the design of pre existent mind or intelligence. Moreover, for many Western thinkers, the idea of a physical universe reflected the purpose or design of a pre existent mind, a creator, served and guaranteed humanity's own sense of purpose and meaning. Yet today, in nearly every academic discipline, from law to literary theory, from behavioral science to biology, a thoroughly materialistic understanding of humanity and its place in the universe has come to dominate. Free will, meaning, purpose, and God have become pejorative terms in the academy. Matter has subsumed mind, cosmos replaced creator. The reasons for this intellectual shift are no doubt complex. Yet clearly, the demise of the design argument itself has played an important role in the loss of this traditional Western belief. Beginning in the Enlightenment, philosophers such as David Hume raised seemingly powerful objections against the design argument. Hume claimed that Pascal design arguments depended on a weak and flawed analogy between biological organisms and human artifacts. Yet for most, it was not the arguments of the philosophers that disposed of design, but the theories of scientists, particularly that of Charles Darwin. If the origin of biological organisms could be explained naturalistically, as Darwin claimed, the explanations invoking intelligent design were unnecessary and even vacuous. Indeed, as Richard Dawkins reported, it was Darwin who made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And that just pretty much sounds like he's saying, if we don't have intelligent design, we just don't have a good foundation for theism. Yeah, and I, I think that's just a really bad move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, yeah. I think, I think it's, well, it's just false. I mean, yeah. the foundation for theism does not depend on a, you know, half dozen mm -hmm. senior fellows who work for a think tank in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, look, I, as again, I respect these guys. I, I, they're, they're all smarter than me, probably. Uh, but, uh, you know, but I just I disagree. I think that theism uh, is based on stronger arguments than that. Mm hmm. And when I was reading, one of the first things I thought was the design argument we're seeing, the modern intelligent design argument, that is not the argument of Aquinas, for instance, in his fifth way, when you leave the God delusion and 
the Richard Dawkins responds to Aquinas and he gets to the fifth way, says, well, this is just the intelligent design argument we see. They, no, it's not. It's a totally different argument. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, the argument offered by Aquinas is an argument that appeals to mm -hmm. um, the, the way in which just the fact that we live in an orderly cosmos, period. Yeah. It's not about specific things in it from yeah. which you infer God. Yeah. In, in, in fact, it probably would have been pretty much impossible for Aquinas to have a design argument like ID back then because he had no way of knowing about DNA or the fine structure of a universe or anything of that sort. But yet he had this kind of argument. A lot of people look at design, they think Paley immediately and then assume everyone beforehand was talking about Paley. And they weren't. I mean, I think Aquinas would follow the route of Eddie and Gerson in this book from Aristotle Darwin back again, look at evolution and say, you know, that is a fine example of my fifth way right there. Yeah, that, I, I think, you know, Nick, my, my theory about this is I think, uh, and this is, has a lot to do with, I think, the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, if you go, like, for example, to the United Kingdom or Australia or New Zealand where you have... Uh, mm -hmm you know, a, a large segments of, uh, large groups of, of Christians, Darwinism is not that big of a deal for them. And I think one reason for that is that they didn't have the Scopes trial. Mm -hmm. They, yeah. you know, so we have that history of the, of the kind of the warfare between science and religion mm -hmm. that, that they've never had. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I've always, you know, I have friends that live in, in, in these countries and they're sort of, they're sort of intrigued by uh, the uh, this aspect of American culture, and so yeah. uh, we don't do that with like any other theory. So, for example, um, it, let's say there's a new theory that comes out about uh, oxygenation. Uh, nobody says, "Oh, wow! Now there's no room for God." Right. It's, it's just a, but I think it has to do with also along the same lines. You know, you have the Scopes trial coming out early 20th century out of an America after the Second Great Revival, where there was a, a, mm -hmm. a particular understanding of how to read scripture uh, that Darwinian evolution really threatened. Mm -hmm. And But again, other, other Christians, very conservative Christians in other countries, didn't have that experience, and so they've had, they're kind of less uptight about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, in, in order to see us as a reputation, you really have to have a certain concept of God that this is the the role God functions on in the universe. And then if you remove this function where God doesn't really play anything, but if you go back and look at Aquinas, or heck, look at Paul, and he says, in him we live and move and have our being, as if to yeah. say, God is the source of our existing, and if you remove yeah. God, whoosh! I know. Yeah. I know. I, I, I've always, you know, in my own sort of personal history, I, I, I've never... It, mm. you know, and then this may be a kind of an odd confession to make, but the whole Darwin thing was never a big deal to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know, I don't know why. I mean, I've always been very critical of people like Dawkins and others who take what they think is science and use it to sort of refute God. I think that's yeah. a mistake and it's important. But I've never quite, um, I've never quite. Mm -hmm. uh, fallen into that um, you know I, I get I, you know I remember years ago I was speaking at a church uh, I, I got I never got re, I, I got I know I know I'll never get I know I, I the pastor told me afterwards that he'd never invite me back I was asked about the whole evolution creation controversy and I said well there are there are three or four different positions that Christians take and he was so upset because I gave the options because in his mind there's only one correct position and that the earth is 10,000 years old and we should read yeah. uh, mm. you know the first chapters of Genesis in a very literalistic way and afterwards he said you're, you're not coming back here again so, but I, and I, I didn't write much about mm. that issue for that reason uh, until I went to law school and you know one of the great ironies is that after publishing my book on, on intelligent design I was accused by people of being a creationist and I was, and I would laugh at that because if there was anything I, I never thought I'd be accused of was that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 
in any event, I think, you know, uh, mm. you know, again, I, I want to, you know, reiterate that I, you know, my, I have wonderful friends in the intelligent design mm. movement, but I, I think that they're, I don't think that they're right about the way in which they're, I think, presenting God's action in nature. Yeah, you know, something that occurs to me just when we're talking about this is that a lot of atheists will tell us that theology is a nonsense study. It's a, it's a study about an object and such. There's no point in it. But as soon as they present these arguments as if they refute God's existence, they have to do theology. It's unavoidable. Yeah. That's right. You know, so, some of these folks, they jealously guard the God they don't believe in. Mm-hmm. Right? So... Yeah, so you get these these, these uh, folks uh, uh, saying things like, "I don't believe in an in a, in a old man in the sky," right? You know, and of course that's not that's never been what theism's about. But you know, of course the problem is that it, I suspect they've run into theists who've presented God, and it does sound like an old man in the sky, mm. <laughs> right? Yeah, I'd like to remind everyone that now you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast. My guest is Dr. Francis Beckwith. We're talking about his book, Taking Rights, R-I-T-E-S, Seriously. And I can you all know that everything we do here at the Deeper Waters Ministries, it's uh, listener-supported by people like you, and we really do need your support. If you go to the website, deeperwaters.ddns.net, if you can't find it, just search for me on there, Nick Peters, you'll find it eventually. And there's a link, help support the work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. Now, you click that link that's in there, and it'll take you to Risen Jesus. You've gone to the right place. Those are my in-laws, Mike and Debbie Lacona, good friends of Dr. Beckwith also. And they are the ones that pretty much are the ones that help us with some money here because my mother-in-law is a financial guru. She knows all about it, and they've got a 501c3 that they can collect that money for us through. So that way, everything can be tax deductible. So you send in your donation, and we get it then. We get every penny of it. And if you can become a monthly donor, that works even better. You become a bread and butter of what we do. And any gift you give, no matter how small, it sure means a lot. It's a great encouragement to us every time we get one. Now, you can also buy books on Amazon. Some I've co-written, such as Defining Inerrancy, or Groundless, or God and Natural Disaster, Natural Evil, or Natural Disaster. It's one of the two. I can't remember right now. It's a book I... Well, it was a debate I had with an atheist on the problem of natural evil. And then one that I've written alone, A Creed for the Ages, The Apostles' Creed, and Today's Christian. And in fact, today I started writing again some, an e-book I'm writing on autism and Asperger, something I live with personally, since my wife and I are both on the spectrum. And then finally, there was a way to actually support us through buying jewelry, because guys, I'm... Uh, not sure how many of you have noticed this, but women seem to like jewelry. One of Ari's friends made her a necklace, for instance, recent, recently from, I think, Keshi is what it's called. So she, you jewelry aficionados out there can correct me if I'm wrong. You'll know what I'm talking about. But Ari loves it. So many times she goes, can you help me put on my necklace and such? Because it has to latch to my back, and I have no problem helping her. I mean, hey, that gets me a little bit closer to her. That's not a problem to me. And so you go here, the code word is love, and you purchase some jewelry, and you get in touch with me or Lena Clester, who runs that, 25% of what you purchase goes to support deeper waters. Now, that's a pretty good deal. You get some jewelry for that screw-up that you've made with a lady in your life, or for that screw-up you're going to make with her, because it will happen. <laughs> and you can get out of a doghouse a little bit easier then. And if you can't support us financially, prayer is always great for us, but please as well consider going on iTunes and leaving a positive review of a Deeper Waters podcast. Uh, I get so excited every time I see a new review showing up. And share the podcast with your friends, your families, and by all means, share it with your skeptical friends, because there's some good material here, I think, that can answer a lot of the objections that we have. Uh, Dr. Beckwith, do you have an organization or charity you'd like to see people support? 
Yeah, you know, I, one of the uh, organizations that um, my wife and I have supported for years are crisis pregnancy centers. I know they, they go by different names in different cities. Sometimes they're called CareNet. But I think any one of those uh, organizations that really are doing a wonderful work mm -hmm. going to women, allowing women who are in crisis pregnancies to make a decision for life, uh, I think that's, I think it, it's well worth uh, your, your, your investment, not only in their lives, but in terms of your own virtue, if I may wax philosophical. Mm. Yep. I just typed in CareNet here for research, and you can find several things here. It's care-net.org, CareNet Pregnancy Centers. So you go there, and you can find some research. And by the way, we have had some great shows on abortion in the past, usually every January, I try and dedicate as much as I can to the topic of abortion or every way. That's one time where you're going to hear boom, 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 uh. show after show on the same kind of topic. So if you want to hear some some arguments for the pro-life position, just go back and listen to those episodes. You know, when we get back to your book, when you get to the final chapter, you do talk about the redefinition of marriage going on. There. And one thing I like that you point out is that this isn't so much about toleration as it is about affirmation. That, that's right. The last chapter deals with um, a couple of thinkers who, who, who are kind of categorized as political liberals. Now, mm -hmm. the term political liberal, we, we use it in our common language to indicate you know, people that tend to be left of center politically, but in the philosophical literature, a political liberal uh, typically is somebody who believes that the state uh, should be as minimal as possible when it mm -hmm. comes to deep disagreements on moral questions. So, for example, the state shouldn't coerce you to do something um, if, let's say, um, this would be kind of typical liberal position would be on abortion. Um, you know, people disagree about when life begins, uh, so the state should not force you to have an uh, force you not to have an abortion. It shouldn't stop you. Now, I, I actually disagree with that position. I think that there are good grounds to make abortion illegal, but it's it's just an example of how the liberal thinks. And so, uh, on a variety of other matters, like um, the church you go to, uh, as long as your exercise of your beliefs do not, does not interfere with somebody else's exercise of their beliefs, and you're not harming people, uh, you know, in a, in, in a horrible way, it, you know, the liberal state says you should, you know, be free to do what you want. Now, uh, in the interesting on the gay marriage question, what I what I've done, because um, it occurred to me when I've, I've taught this literature for years and 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 in the last couple of years though as i've seen as as same sex marriage has become legally recognized in different states and now everywhere there's these cases arise where you have let's say a a christian photographer or a christian baker or florist and different states have you know refused to uh l lend their services to uh, same-sex ceremonies, some cases weddings, some cases receptions, and they've been fined oh, uh, large penalties, right? So in some cases, I think one in Colorado or maybe it was Oregon was fined $135,000, which would, you know, destroy the business mm -hmm. uh, based on anti-discrimination law. Was and sweet takes by Melissa, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. So... So these are, uh, you know, this is happening in many places around the country, and we've also seen attempts on the part of certain states to pass laws to permit these businesses not to uh, materially cooperate with ceremonies they believe are immoral, and some, in some cases those laws have not passed because of great pressure by corporations, right, like, um, or, and even uh, groups like the NC2A, uh, Apple computers and so forth, and but it occurred to me, you know, wait a second, liberalism has always taught that on these deep questions about human sexuality, on religion, we we should let people 
we shouldn't coerce people. I mean, this is, this is part of sort of the, the liberalism that comes out of the 1970s and 80s. There are certain thinkers that are uh, uh, connected with this. Ronald Dworkin, a gentleman who, who I mentioned earlier, John Rawls, Thomas Nagel, Judith mm -hmm. Jarvis Thompson. These are all leading philosophers who have kind of offered this kind of liberalism as a way for us to kind of get along with each other. And now there's, this is a case where you actually have, what, a wedding? What is a wedding? Now, for some people, a wedding is, is, a, is no, no different than, let's say, uh, a perfunctory ceremony, right? So they can live together. But to most people, in fact, to most religious people, weddings are not just symbolic, they're actual, they actually have real, um, they, they, they shape the way we think about our relationship to both our history and our future. So we tend to think of weddings like we think of baptisms and bar mitzvahs and burials, right? These are important life events. And in fact, I, I mentioned this in the chapter, for most religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, weddings have sacramental significance, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine this. Imagine uh, w there was a, 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 a photographer, uh, we'll call him Aristotle Jones, Let's say Aristotle Jones is the photographer. Uh, no, 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 the wrong character. He's not Aristotle. Aristotle Jones is the photographer. Russell Less is the photographer. So let's say this is a, a story I don't use in the book, but I've used it in several of my lectures. Okay, mm -hmm. say Russell Less. Russell Less is a photographer. He's a Southern Baptist photographer. He has a dear friend in Aristotle Jones. Aristotle Jones comes to Russ and he says, Russ, I need to procure your services. What for? Oh, um... I, uh, my wife and I just had a baby and we're going to have the baby baptized at St. Nicholas Eastern Orthodox Church down the street. And Russell says, Aristotle, I love you, man, but you know what? I'll take pictures of you and your wife and your child in or near any body of water. <laughs> you can be in a bathtub, you can be by the ocean, you can be in a swimming pool, but I can't do this with the baptism thing because I don't think it's a real baptism I'm a Southern Baptist I believe in believers baptism and for me to phot photograph it I sense I feel that I'm cooperating with something that I don't think is real mm -hmm. now it seems to me that Aristotle Jones should say you know I respect you so much Russ I'm not gonna file a grievance with <laughs> with the local government you know that you violated my religious liberty I can go somewhere else, but I do respect your candor, and I hope this doesn't, you know, influence our friendship. Right. Oh, so that, that, what I say essentially in this last chapter is that I just am mystified by how liberals for generations who have articulated clearly and carefully a kind of respect for these deep differences now, when they have power have just simply discarded all that and say, we're just going to make you do this, even if it bankrupts you, even if it violates your conscience, mm -hmm. even, if it, even if we have to destroy you on, on social media, we don't care. Yeah. And it's not about getting the product or the service, because we can get it anywhere else, right? There mm -hmm. are thousands of others who'd be willing to do it, yeah. but we want to punish you and hurt you. To me, this is so outrageous, Nick. I just... Yeah. I'm, I'm just mystified by how liberals who, who I've respected, even though I've disagreed with them on a variety of questions, have simply kind of become something that I never thought they'd become. The, the, the very tyrants and moral scolds that they have always accused us of being. Mm -hmm. And it's just, the great irony here is that they're, they've become more fundamentalistic than the worst fundamentalist. Right. I mean, so so even even let's say the, the most fundamentalist Southern Baptist um, uh, believer in believers baptism is going to respect Aristotle Jones, right. <laughs> you know, or to reverse it. Even the most um, the, the the most uh, avid believer in in infant baptism, uh, Catholic or Orthodox or Anglican, is is not going to use the state to coerce Russell Less to take the photographs, mm -hmm. right? In fact, we, we, have, we have people like uh, Thomas Aquinas, who in the, uh, in the Middle Ages, when the Western world was largely Christian, say to Christians, 
it's wrong for a Christian to baptize the infant child of a Jewish couple because it's against natural justice. <laughs> so so you, you found greater tolerance among the so-called medieval, you know, intolerant people than you find among liberals today. Yeah, that, that tolerance, as far as I'm concerned, it's always been a one-way street. And then yeah. as soon as they get in power, all of a sudden tolerance isn't really that great a virtue. That's right. It, it's it's more of a, it's it's like a gateway drug, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you you, you, you you it leads to other things, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, yeah. no. In fairness, though, I do have some very liberal friends who are are horrified by this as well. So it mm -hmm. isn't that I'm, I don't want to paint with a broad brush here, but but yeah, there are uh, there's been a real sea change. Uh, I I think we've you know what, my friend Jay Budzhevsky who teaches at the University of Texas right. in an art in a ch book chapter that he published about two years ago said it really well. He said. We've gone from a liberal state to a secular confessional state. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, we think of confessional states, we think of post-Reformation nations or communities like um, Calvin's Geneva, um, you know, Luther's Germany, right, where, where there were, the states took sides post-Reformation with different groups, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then that gave way eventually to a, a liberal state, right? Right. And now, now what, what, what Jay is saying is that we're going back to a confessional state, but to a secular confessional state. Mm -hmm. So liberalism may have been a kind of vacation from history. <laughs> it, it, it may be with it, mm -hmm. you know, may, maybe the case we can't live but with a confessional state. Uh, you know, I, you know, I don't know. I tend to be kind of an optimist. I think we can live in a pluralistic community and have deep differences and get along. Maybe I, I, I'm suffering from naivete. But J Jay argues that, that this shift has occurred over the past five to ten years, and I think he's right. I think it's a really good analysis. And mm -hmm. so we, we have our liberals, or what used to be liberals, uh, who have now uh, become like the, uh, like the people that they claim that they've never liked, mm -hmm. right? You know, yeah. the, the moral scolds, the, um, the uh, busy... Boys. Busy buddies, right? All you know, the sort of like kind of the secular church ladies, right? Yes. Uh, and it's it's really hilarious to see it, but it's also sad because real people are really hurt. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like you to comment on <clears throat> a composition that's put forward against Christians and social media because when you said it, it's absolutely hysterical to hear you say it because it turns the objection on its end. And that's usually that if you meet someone who opposes homosexual behavior or redefining marriage such they're accused of being homophobes of having homophobia and you tell us what your response to that is well uh, the, the pro I mean there's a couple of well what one response is that I, I don't know if this is the one you're referring to I've responded to it in different venues but uh, but a phobia if you think about it is what a kind of mental disorder right yes. like claust claustrophobia mm -hmm. or um, you know I guess kleptomania, right? I guess you could be kleptophobic, right? Afraid of being stolen, mm -hmm. right? Or uh, claustomania. You like close places. Uh, but, but, you know, all these phobias or manias are, are things we don't ridicule. We don't make fun of people for having, right? right? We actually think there's some, you know, that, that they should be cured, right? But, but it's odd that to be accused of a phobia is, is, is in fact, is something that you shouldn't, you shouldn't use as a kind of bludgeon. You should be charitable to people who are suffering from these things, right? Mm -hmm. right. So uh, it, it seems kind of odd. I don't know if that's the response yes. uh, that, that, yes. I, that you're referring to. Yeah, I published it in an article about 15 years ago. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's an odd sort of thing. Now, uh, one of the, I, I do address it very briefly in, in the book. There was one of the uh, referees that is one of the people that had read an earlier version of my chapter when it was published as a journal article said that all I was defending was homophobia and my response to that was that that in a society in, in a free society in which people uh, are reasonably intelligent we're bound to come to different conclusions on human sexuality we do ourselves no good by simply calling people a vile name because mm -hmm. we disagree mm -hmm. with them mm -hmm. right I mean look if you think about it, people that think that homosexual conduct is immoral and that same-sex marriage is not a real thing, base it on 
what looks like to be the design of our sexual powers. Mm-hmm. Right now, yeah. I understand why people would disagree with it, but it's not a crazy belief. It's not like believing like the moon is made of cheese or that I'm really Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz. Right. I mean, those those are crazy beliefs. But it's so it's weird to to to, to hear the, the the ease by which people engage in this name calling. It just doesn't make any sense. I mean. Uh, you know, if you go to most of the world, I mean, we live in the West, right? So we're, these issues are really big deal. But if you go to Africa or Asia or even, you know, nations that have modern technology like Russia, there is no sympathy for this kind yeah. of view of human sexuality, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe we're the outliers and maybe we're, we're mistaken, mm-hmm. right? You know, uh, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking, for instance, that... Uh, Probably shortly after this, if not today, sometime this week, uh, at our, the apartment complex my wife and I live at, Fapur has just opened. And she's going to go down there and get some exercise because she loves the water. Me? Mr. Rationality is freakishly terrified mm. of the water. I will start screaming and panicking, but she wants me to be able to face it and I want to be able to to get past that to learn how to move at least the basics in the water and you know if you knew that about me and you saw me in pool and you saw me panicking it would be a sick sick person who would use that to make fun yeah aquaphobic um, yeah aqua yeah that's yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah you know when you get to the end of your book also you have a story about a, a lady who's a hot sex lady who's extremely educated and she's being set to be interviewed for a position and she's asked, will you let your religious beliefs influence your judgment? And that's the question that we're often asked as if somehow we're supposed to separate our religious beliefs from our other beliefs. That's right. Yeah, the story I tell, it's a fictional story about a uh, woman nominated to the U.S. Supreme Court who is has a law degree as well as a doctorate in one of the, I think in bio, I think I gave her biological sciences as her PhD. And uh, she's written some really important articles on the relation between science and law, on things like DNA testing and uh, other topics of interest that overlap law and science. But she also happens to be a very devout Christian who's a pro-lifer who has written academic articles defending the pro-life position on abortion. Uh, the U.S. senators who are sitting on the Judiciary Committee, some of them ask her, ask, or at least one of, her, one of them asks her, are you going to let your religious belief influence your judging? And my point of telling that story is that nobody asks her if, she, if, if she's going to let her scientific beliefs influence her judging, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, right. Why? why? Why do we think this way? Well, it's because generally people don't think of theology as being part of a knowledge tradition. And that, I think, is a mistake. And I think that there are several reasons why it's a mistake. One is that theologians engage in reasoning just like uh, scientists do, just like lawyers do, just like economists do, just like accountants do, just like artists do, right? I mean, these are, these are all uh, different ways uh, of, of the, in which people engage in activities in which reasoning occurs, and we believe that, that there can be real knowledge there, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the point of the story is, is to say that, that, that religion is being treated in a way that is as if it's somehow sub-rational. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I don't, and, you know, after all, you know, we, you know, we can, you know, people disagree on even in these other traditions. So, so there's a famous case uh, the Supreme Court held called, heard called the Rosenberger case in which uh, – Justice uh, Justice uh, Thomas and Justice Souter have this dispute about how to properly interpret certain American founders on church state separation. Now, nobody's going to say that, oh, well, because there's disagreement on in history about history, therefore history is not knowledge tradition. Right. So you can't you can't use that about theology. Mm-hmm. In addition, there are many aspects of a person's character and life that we think are totally relevant. So. When Sotomayor, when Justice uh, Sotomayor was nominated uh, by President Obama, uh, one of the things she talked about was her growing up as a um, Puerto Rican American in the Bronx, New York City, and she she talked about that shaping her character and her ideas. 
uh, I think it's perfectly relevant to bring that up. I think people ought to be able to appeal to their own personal histories when it's relevant to what they're doing. Right. Well, part of a person's mm -hmm. personal history can also include their theological training, mm -hmm. right? So why, 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 why is that bad? So, yeah. so my point is that religion is treated in a denigrated way mm -hmm. that other sorts of aspects of our identity, whether it's our personal history or our you know, education outside of the law, would not be treated. Mm. Yeah, I was just thinking about what you were saying. I, I, can't, I can't imagine a counterpart with someone who is a radical atheist having similar credentials and such going through and getting to a spot where being interviewed and being to asked, well, are you going to let your secular beliefs interfere with your judgments? Yeah, can, can you imagine if, let's say, and I don't know if this is true about Justice Breyer, but I'm, let's say it, I'm just going to make it up, so it's just, just a fictional thing. Imagine when Justice Breyer, who is Jewish, uh, let's say when he was nominated to the Supreme Court by uh, President Clinton, you could have said this actually for uh, uh, Kagan, uh, Elena, uh, Justice Elena Kagan and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who are both mm -hmm. ethnically Jewish as well. Imagine if, if somebody had asked Kagan, well, what synagogue you do you belong to? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't go to synagogue. Oh, what are you, an atheist? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, the outrage would just be, we, we would never hear the end of it, right? Oh, this right. is not right. This is in, but, what, what, but why is it okay when it comes to religious citizens to pry into their... Now, obviously, in the, in the fictional case uh, I made, the person was actually writing in this area. Uh, it was part of their academic work as well, and that's perfectly legitimate. But uh, I can easily imagine if somebody were let's say a devout, uh, let's say Catholic or evangelical or, or let's say an observant Orthodox Jew and they were nominated to the court, it's supposed to they didn't write in any, on any of these social issues. I guarantee you someone on the court is going to say, well, do you agree with your church on this matter? Mm -hmm. And of course, I don't think there, there, you would get the same kind of pushback that you would if the same sort of inquiry was made to an atheist. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about how Peter Bogosian on that sure you're familiar with his work on that, that you wrote the, the manual for creating atheists, and his idea is that if you find someone of religious persuasion, tell them they can set up a kid's table until they're ready to talk about evidence and reason. With yeah. Adults. Yeah. Well, that's, a, ironically, it's a very childish way yeah. to, to engage one's critics. And I'm also thinking about how uh, Robbie Zacharias would say, imagine watching a television talk show and you've got some different positions on there. You've got a lawyer, you've got a politician, you've got a comedian, you've got a scientist, you've got a doctor, and you've got a minister. Which one is the audience automatically going to think is the most biased? Yeah, the minister, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this is why, um, you know, even in our politics today, uh, the appeal to experts yeah. uh, really... Uh, silences people. So I remember years ago, I was talking to J.P. Moreland about this. Uh, this was, I guess, when the, uh, I think it was the American Psychological Association had uh, issued some kind of comments about uh, homosexuality. And uh, it was obviously positive about uh, homosexual orientation. And I asked J.P., I said, what would have happened if the Evangelical Theological Society issued a press release you know, making comments about certain moral practices, right, including homosexuality or, you know, abortion, um, would the media treat those individuals as experts, right? I mean, and of course not, mm -hmm. right? Because psychology, and it was interesting, what, what does psychology have to do with a moral question anyways, right? right. I mean, it's a sort of odd thing, right? Nobody, nobody goes to a dermatologist to find out about race, Right, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of weird. You know, you think what what they don't really have an expertise, right? So what happens is the what, but this this kind of expertise, this kind of tyranny of experts. What you get is you have a moral question uh, converted to a scientific question, mm -hmm. or a kind of quasi scientific question, right? So that way you don't have to actually deal with the moral question anymore. You just mm -hmm. it, it's no longer it's out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. And that gives us back to what we were talking about at the beginning, that it's everything <coughs> when automatically jumps to where if it's scientific, then that's what's valid. I mean, if you present any evidence for any position, it's where it has to be scientific evidence. Yeah, hmm. that's right. So, so this leaves us in, in many ways, a pretty 
bleak position that we're in a world where it, we're saying religious beliefs are to be automatically discounted, they are to be found, they are to be presumed guilty until they are shown, shown to be innocent. Instead, what are we supposed to do? Well, I think I, you know, I don't think there's one particular thing that mm-hmm. we can do, and I, there's there's no silver bullet right. <laughs> or magic bullet that's gonna that's gonna solve everything. I do think uh, the leadership of of churches that have to uh, have to understand what's going on behind the scenes, and what I mean by that is that in, in the, especially in the in the academic literature concerning uh, religious liberty. Uh, there's a lot of material that's been published in the past 10 or 15 years that is, I think, um, should should really get the attention of Christians that argue that religion is not only irrational, but it should not be given any sort of um, special treatment. So, for example, these folks would eliminate from our Constitution uh, the First Amendment or the portion of the First Amendment dealing with religion. Um, uh, why? Because religious belief can be subsumed under something like a right to autonomy or a right to do whatever you want. So going to church is no different than going to a Rolling Stones concert. It's just one of the personal preferences that you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I would like to see more uh, Christian philosophers writing in this area. Uh, most, you know, most of the people that write in this area are lawyers or have legal backgrounds. I'm one of the few people that writes uh, in this area that has both a philosophical and a legal background who is sympathetic uh, to the uh, religious positions. Uh, most people aren't that are out mm-hmm. there, and most of them are largely ignorant of of the case of the reasonableness for faith. And so one of the chapters that I have, it's the first chapter of the book, or the second chapter, the second uh, the, the first main chapter, but the second chapter of the book, deals with how many of these scholars misrepresent and I think in most cases misunderstand the nature of religious beliefs and uh, last year at the Evangelical Theological Society I don't know if you were in my in my when I delivered my paper on yes, that I was. and I, I and I, I had Bill Craig uh, who I deeply respect uh, he didn't ask a question he raised his hand he said Frank thank you so much for doing this work uh, you know I didn't even know it didn't even know this kind of work had to be done yeah. And I said, well, this is why I, I decided to submit this as a paper proposal for this conference. I want to encourage Christian philosophers to, to get a, to get their hands dirty, mm. get involved, you know, publish in law reviews. Uh, now, there's not a lot of literature out there, but the literature that's out there is largely unanswered. Mm. Uh, and so I do think that has to be done. I think uh, pastors have to be educated to be able to communicate to their uh, their flock. Uh, about the reasonableness of, of one's beliefs, but also I think we have to, uh, I think, re-energize our spiritual lives. That mm-hmm. it's not all about the intellect. I think we could right. be sort of uh, too, um, you know, uh, emphasize too much about that because at the end of the day, the attacks that we get from the secular world are not going to be resolved in, in our life. I don't think it's, they're going to be resolved in our lifetime. We need to be fully ensconced in our communities mm-hmm. and we have to build up our communities we have to make our schools better our churches better our institutions better mm-hmm. uh, we, and I think then we should maybe worry about the world <laughs> but, right. but I do think we have to be uh, we, we have to remember look in, in a social media world our young people are being indoctrinated uh, by a culture that we put them in unarmed Mm-hmm. And and what I mean by armed is just not giving arguments. It's also having a deep spiritual life, uh, having a life of prayer, a life of devotion, and being deeply involved with our communities. Mm-hmm. I can I, I can speak you know from my own experience. I you know, I, you know I'm an academic. I read this stuff, and um, and what really sustains me isn't just the arguments. It's the fact that I begin every day with scripture reading and prayer. So do I. And I think that's. That's, I think, as I've gotten older, I see, I see that as, as far more important uh, than, than I, I gave it credit for when I was younger. Yeah, and I then, the end of that, babe, we're, t- we're talking about how a society is dishonoring marriage. Something that we have to do as Christians is to make sure we are honoring marriage ourselves because it's, 
seems like a lot of us didn't really think marriage was that important until the homosexuals came along. And now all of a sudden we're interested in marriage, but we should have been interested in it to begin with. Yeah, I mean, we, we, have, to, we have to be an example, and we also uh, we have to get our own houses in order, which I think you, you're saying. We, yeah. we, we, have to, uh, we have to do things in a way so that people will be drawn to the gospel, not just because of our words or because of our deeds. Yeah, they will know we are Christians by our love. That's right. Well, Dr. Beckwith, we've come to the end of our time. If uh, people want to find out more about you, do you have a blog or website where people can get in touch with you? Yeah, they can go to my, my, my website, francisbeckwith.com. That's F-R-A-N-C-I-S-B-E-C-K-W-I-T-H.com. And that's, mm -hmm. from there, there's, you can get my writings, some of my writings and books and, and so forth. Yeah. And I'd like people to know the book, Taking Rights Seriously, Law, Politics, and the Reasonableness of Faith. I'm looking online right now on Kinder. It's $23. The paperback is twenty eight eleven. Now, if you want to uh, splurge and go over a hardback, that's eighty eight eighty seven right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, don't, yeah, don't buy the hardback. It's softback. It's, uh, it's cheaper, and you get all the same material. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have uh, any final message you'd like to leave today for the Deeper Waters audience? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to just encourage people that, uh, you know, that are kind of observers and followers of what goes on in our popular culture that uh, remember that in every age, Christians have different tasks and different responsibilities. And our responsibility may just be to be faithful. Mm -hmm. And that by our faithfulness, the culture may change, but we may not see it in our lifetime. Right. When Augustine... Uh, saw the barbarians entering the gates that protected Rome. He didn't live long enough to see the high Middle Ages, mm -hmm. right? And the greatness of that, right? With Dante and Aquinas. And so we have to remember that each age has its ups and its downs, and that the best we can do is to remain faithful. Well, Dr. Beth, I'd like to thank you for coming on our show today, and I really hope we'll see you back here again sometime. Well, thank you for having me, Nick. I'd like to remind everyone that next week we're going to have Sean McDowell on talking about the fate of the apostles. What happened to them after the resurrection? For now, I'm Nick Peters, and I'm signing off. <laughs>